Today on Muscle Car, we'll show you how to customize a rear bumper to give it a one-of-a-kind look with an aerodynamic edge. Later, the guys do motor mock-up and slip some new floors in the olds. And Flashback takes a look at a fancy Ford. Hey y'all, welcome to Muscle Car. Today we're gonna get up close and personal with our Oldsmobile Hearst Tribute Car. I've got some custom bumper mods I'm gonna throw at the back side of her, and then we're gonna look at poking in some front floor pans. But first things first, this back bumper's got some nice style lines to it, and it was a good complement to the original look of the car. But we're slowly changing the landscape of the sheet metal. I've got some ideas to bring this thing up to speed with the rest of the modifications that we've done to the car. But it's all gonna start with getting it acquainted with some masking tape. We took this thing over to our buddies at Advanced Plating to get the chrome stripped off of it. That way it makes it a heck of a lot easier to get paint, primer, filler, whatever to stick to it. Okay, I'm measuring because I want to incorporate a rear diffuser on this thing. And I'm making a couple marks to see what will work and what won't. I always like to square out my designs, more or less at 90. A lot easier to get those accurate. And then come back, shape out what you like, then just cut and pull the tape out of the way. <laughs> I like to use that water tape when laying stuff out because it's a little more stable. But whenever you start doing the radiuses, the thinner stuff is the way to go. Also, there's nothing wrong with using a template with whatever you can find around the shop that's got a good radius to it. After laying out what I thought I wanted, I don't like it. The height of it is a little bit too high because of the body line that's factory stamped into the bumper. I need to bring it down probably, it looks like about an inch and a half, two inches. So the tape is definitely the way to go because if you would have cut into this thing, you would have done messed up. And sometimes you gotta use that old calibrated eyeball. I'll repeat the steps that I took the first time to get my corners laid in. Now that I've determined the amount I want to cut off the lower section, I'm ready to let some sparks fly. But before I cut it, I'm going to cut out this license plate recess and move it up just a little bit to help the looks. Let me show you something. It's a good idea to use a marker and run it along the edge where you're going to cut at, especially when using tape. Because whenever you're using a grinder or something, the metal gets hot and sometimes the tape blows off. With a mark on it, you still know where you got to cut at. This bumper is made of some serious metal, so I've adapted this Matco electric grinder to carry one of our Industrial Depot cutting wheels. The grinder has a lot more oomph than the air tools that we typically use. I'll use a file and air grinder to knock off the burrs and bevel the edge. Then it's just a matter of tacking in our panel. For the corners, I'll also grab my air saw because it has no trouble making those tight turns. A little more tape and some more quality time with the air saw. We'll have the bottom of our plate prepped for the next step. Well, we're pretty much done cutting metal out and we're at a point to start putting some in. After the break, Tommy puts the puzzle pieces into place as the Oldsmobile's bumper comes back together. Then, gotta make room for a big old tranny? See how to make a relief cut in a tranny tunnel. Well, we're well on our way to having us a custom rear bumper for the back side of our Hearst Olds Tribute Car. And I've cut a giant hole in the back side of it, and I've already started cutting the pieces that I'm going to use to rebuild it. And when we're all said and done, we're going to have us a piece of art that's one of a kind. Now, I could have made this insert one giant piece, but I decided to make it in sections. That way it makes it easier to manage. What I like to do is to do the straight sections first, and then come back and do the radiuses. When I made this next piece that I'm putting in here, I used our Tinsmith metal brake to put some bends in it. To make a gradual angle, I bent the metal by hand instead of using the lever. Now you can make something similar to this using a vise. Let me show you. It's really pretty simple. Just stick the metal into a vise and do your bends by hand, or use a hammer to gradually work it over. 
Now if you're doing a larger piece, you may have to cut it into a smaller section to get it to fit into the vise. But the end result, if you take your time, will be pretty much the same. Make sure you're using the right metal for the job that you're working on. This bumper is made of thicker metal than the body panels. And I'm using 10 gauge steel, which matches up to the bumper pretty well. A cardboard template helps me to not waste steel. And once I've got it cut to shape, I'll reproduce it in metal and tack it in. A die grinder with a rotary file on the end of it will finish up our inside corner. This little recess around the license plate hole needed to have a patch put in it. So I made me a template using a piece of cardboard, transferred it to a piece of steel. It should work rather nice to fill the hole. What I'll do is make sure that I've got this piece carved out the way I want it. Then draw a line around it so that I can cut the metal out that would be hanging behind it. By not doing this, what it creates is a pocket for moisture, dirt, debris to collect. And then you've got yourself a rust farm, and that's what you don't want. Once I use the aerosol to get rid of all the unwanted metal, I can tack in my patch and call it good. When working with intricate pieces like we are, a magnet like this one that we got from Madco can make this job a lot easier. No more tacking is necessary. It's time to burn this dude in. Then I'm gonna love up on it with a grinder for a little while. The smoother you get it now, the less body work you'll have to do later. Well, I got all my grinding wrapped up and I don't think it turned out half bad. This mod is similar to the diffusers that you see on a lot of race cars, which reduce aerodynamic drag along with looking just plain cool. With all that took care of, we're one step closer to taking our O's down the road. But y'all know how that goes. We still got a long ways to go. Still ahead, we take a look at a cherry piece of Detroit iron. And later, we're back in the studio with the O's, where the guys do some serious floor surgery. Stick around. Today's flashback, a 1967 Ford Fairlane GTA. There is nothing like the feeling of driving a car that you've built yourself. And Bob Carter has built many Fords in his lifetime. He spent over three decades on the assembly lines in Detroit, building some of the finest blue oval cars. This pristine 67 Fairlane GTA is his prized possession, and he doesn't mind taking it out for a spin with the top down even in the dead of winter. I like to drive it because it has, you know, quite a lot of zip to it and uh, get a lot of attention from people that really don't know, you know, how old the car is or what kind it is. The Fairlane first hit the road in 1955 as a full-size car, but shrunk to a mid-size in 62, filling the gap between the compact Falcon and the massive Galaxy. Now Ford wanted to take on the mighty GTO, so in 66, they redesigned the Fairlane, enlarging the engine bay, and dropping in a big block V8 for the first time. This 67 has a 394 barrel, which could belt out 320 horses. It uses a cast iron mid-rise manifold and features the same hot cam and valve train as the 428 Cobra jet. Fairlanes came in a wide range of packages, including the 500, the XL, the GT, and the GTA. The GTA was virtually the same as the GT, except the A meant that it was an automatic. The Select Shift Cruise-O-Matic gave you the best of both worlds. Some people like automatic transmission. It functioned like an ordinary automatic for everyday driving. Or for extra control, you could use it like a three-speed and shift it from first to second to drive. GTAs came with power front disc brakes, blacked out grill treatment, wide oval tires with deluxe wheel covers, bucket seats, and plenty of badges and stripes. Power domes replaced hood louvers this year and had integrated turn signals. The 289 V8 was standard with a two or four barrel 390 as an added option. 67's got a slight makeover from the 66 models. The grill got three vertical crossbars and a crest was added in the center as well as on the rear. Taillights also got a new stack design to match the headlights. To lower the top, first you had to unzip the glass rear window and lay it flat. Then you let the car do the rest. 
the GTA held its own against more powerful muscle cars like the 442 and Chevelle, but it couldn't quite top the GTO, unless that Tiger was an automatic. Production fell by 40% in 67 to a total of just 20,787. This was the second and final year for the Fairlane GTA, with the Torino GT replacing it in 68. The GTA's limited production life and status as the first of the big block Fairlanes make it highly collectible today. There's no doubt this car is close to Bob's heart. I suppose after spending almost 30 years at Ford, you get a little Ford in your blood. Coming up, wedging a modern motor and transmission into an old-timey automobile. You're watching Muscle Car. For a DVD copy of this episode, just go to PowerBlockTV.com and order your copy for just $5.95 plus shipping and handling. Start your own Muscle Car collection, delivered right to your door from the PowerBlock. We're jumping over here to get some work done on our Oldsmobile. Today we want to get our motor and transmission mocked up to see what we got to do to our floor pan. This isn't exactly the transmission we're going to be running. We borrowed this one from Horsepower, but it's close enough we can get by. And from the factory, Arnold's rolled out the assembly line with an automatic and three gears. Well, we're going to be doubling that to six. Plus, we're going to add a third pedal. Now, the sheer size of that late model transmission means that we're going to have to do some modifications to the floor. Well, as long as we're there, we might as well repair all this rust damage. It's not a bad idea to go ahead and pull the shifter so you don't have to wrestle it into the tunnel. Well, I'm going to cover this up because even though this is a mock-up transmission, it's still a good transmission. I don't want a bunch of junk falling down inside of it. A little more. With the motor mounts bolted, we'll slide a jack under the tranny and see how high it can ride. Okay, floor's coming up. Wow, that's it, huh? Well, from what I can see, I think we may have lucked out here. It's like all we have to do is mainly cut out this little low spot right through here, and I think that'll let the transmission come up and relax a little bit. So, I don't know. We'll see. Hopefully we got lucky. Now when you're relief cutting, it's a good idea to start small and keep trimming until the hole is big enough. That way you can keep a close eye on what you're cutting and prevent having to go back and replace metal that never had to come out. Huh, I'll be darn. Well, we gained quite a bit of space there. Well, that wasn't near the hassle that we were expecting. I mean, I've heard horror stories of guys dang near cutting cars in half to get these transmissions mounted, but hey, we're sitting at the right height and we're ready to move forward. So now we need to figure out where we want to cut our floor pan. We got our replacement panels from year one. They offer a full floor pan, but luckily for us, only the fronts were bad. So we just opted for the partial replacement panel. There's a few things to consider when installing a patch. You don't really have to use the entire panel. My plan is to cut right across this line because it's a little easier to blend in your metalwork like it's not even ever been repaired. Now this panel originally is welded under the rocker and to the inner rocker, but doing it my way saves us a little work. <laughs> now I'm going to use an aerosol. You don't really have to. You could use a cutoff wheel or a plasma. But the problem with the plasma is there's always the chance that you're going to have to dress the steel because of the slag. With the aerosol, you don't have to do that. But it's very loud! Another thing to pay attention to is your inner floor braces. You can see the spot welds of where it's attached to the floor pan. If you just cut straight across, you damage the floor supports and you'd have to make that repair. Now using a grinder with a cutoff wheel, I'm going to slice through just the first layer. Now all we got to do is drill out some spot welds and this panel will be out. This is one of those times that there's the right tool for the job. I'm going to use a Matco spot weld cutter. This makes working on a panel like this a whole lot easier. This thing is basically a tiny hole saw. What it allows you to do is cut through one panel without damaging the metal underneath. With that eighth inch bit, what I did is I gave this thing a seat for it to kind of ride in. Then you put it back on there, squish it down, pull the trigger. You go to cut out your new panel, you want to trim it a little bit larger than the original. It gives you a little extra room when you go to install it. 
The reason that you want to leave that extra overhang is that it's always easier to come back and trim a little more off, but it's a whole nother story when you gotta add it back in. A little extra time during fitment can save you a lot of work on the back end, so make sure you do it right the first time. I got the patch mostly fit, so I'm gonna go ahead and start welding it in. That way it doesn't wiggle around nearly as much as I finish the trim part of it. A couple of Clecos will also help hold her still. With it tacked into place, I'm gonna take my saw and run back through this joint. What that does is that opens it up just in case the two panels are pushing against each other. Also, that gives me a little bit of room for a good butt weld. Well, she's all tacked in. All it needs now is a little bit of welding and grinding, and that'll be all she wrote. The other side is pretty much the same, but I'm gonna let Rick have a stab at it. <laughs> Thanks. Well, the good news is this side ain't much worse off than the first side was. The bad news is we're all out of TV time for the week. If you guys have any questions about anything you saw on the show today, you can check it all out at PowerBlockTV.com. But until next time, we're out of here.